Um, and as Stacy mentioned, we are trying to make use of the data that HCRC is making available to us. But um, first apology is that actually the data I'm going to show you doesn't come from the Hathi Trust co collection today, but I'm going to explain to you how we hope to use it and talk about some of the problems of scaling up to that size of a collection. Um, second apology, I was forced at the last moment to export my slides from Keynote to PowerPoint, so some of the transitions and things didn't come through, and especially there's supposed to be a background on this which would make it more readable. But um, the, the goal for me today is to uh, explain to you where I think we're going with this, which is beyond being able to generate nice pictures of, of uh, networks of terms and so on, to trying to do some interesting analysis of wh what these data are telling us and, and hoping to understand some of the models better that, are, uh, that we're working with. So just very quickly to, oh, wrong machine. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm on this one. Um, uh, I just want to just acknowledge uh, a few people uh, who have been instrumental in the project. Um, and particularly Jamie Murdoch, you, um, bottom right there, who will be around the room later this morning and uh, is very equipped to answer any technical questions. And Robert Rose, who doesn't look like the, the robot, but he is a, a robot um, and uh, he's just shy around cameras, I think. Um, and of course, we've, there are a number of other people in the room who've been uh, very supportive and helpful and acknowledge the, the funding we've had from IU and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Now, uh, what is this graph in the background? Well, um, <clears throat> what we're looking at here is a network of terms from two different encyclopedias. Um, I've been working for a long time with the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is an online dynamic uh, encyclopedia, um, obviously of philosophy, that's been in, in production for about uh, uh, 17, 18 years now. Um, and one of the questions we might have as philosophers is how does the coverage of this encyclopedia differ from the coverage of, of another encyclopedia? So there happens to be another open access uh, encyclopedia of philosophy online, the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And the question is can we do any analysis and, and can we use uh, visualizations to help us understand the difference between these two? I'm going to come back to examples such as this one, not this one exactly, but if you take Kant and you lay out the terms on a semantically neutral background between the two encyclopedias. So I, I can explain later how that happens. Um, and then you, you, you see a cluster of names in the top left there. You see a cluster of concepts in the, in the bottom right here. This is using a particular model uh, developed here at IU by Mike Jones uh, called the Beagle Composite Model that, again, I won't have time to explain in detail. But you can see that the strongest terms for the SEP colored in red and the strongest terms, most similar terms for the IEP according to this model colored in blue um, show some differences. Um, and in particular, anybody who knows anything about the, the history of philosophy will recognize that for the Stanford Encyclopedia, there's much more attention to early modern philosophy and contemporary analytic philosophy, at least at this level of analysis, this grain of analysis, whereas for the uh, Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you're seeing names like Schopenhauer and Deleuze, which re reflects a more continental European orientation down towards the bottom left of the diagram here. So these are the kinds of, of visualizations which we don't think are ends in themselves, but are spurs to help us think harder about the data that we're getting and what the models on those data are providing. So um, <clears throat> what might philosophers do with millions of words? Well, before we get into the Hattie Trust collection, how much are we looking at? Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is 12 million words. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy is 4 million words. And we've also been working with uh, the Phil Papers database, which is um, a collection of about 480,000 bibliographic records, about half of which come with abstracts. So titles and abstracts together give you about 21 million words there. Um, and of course, you might go, well, just read them all. You're philosophers. What else do you do? Um, and if you work that out, that's something like 2,500 hours if you can read at 250 words a minute, roughly a page a minute, which I've converted into the faculty familiar one sabbatical year. It's working <laughs> 50 hours a week. Um, so you, you're going to be forced into reading them selectively, but how do you do that? And if you add in the 2.6 million uh, volumes that we heard about yesterday from the Happy Trust Public Domain Collection, we're now into the range of about 230 to 250 billion words. That's roughly what I calculate on the basis of this. Um, 
so uh, as Stacy mentioned, we have a Digging Into Data grant here, myself and Caddy Berner here at, uh, at IU and some partners in the UK. And our dream is that we ought to be able to uh, uh, mine all of these data from the Hattie Trust Collection and actually map philosophy on to various backgrounds, such as uh, one thing that Katy is very interested in and I as a philosopher of science am very interested in, such as the, uh, the map of, a map of science. So this is just a mock-up, but our idea is that we can perhaps identify places in science by looking at the collection where philosophical discussion and debate is especially uh, prominent. So you might think that there's more philosophy going on, let's say, in comparative psychology, which is an area I happen to be interested in, than in, let's say, geology, right? Um, there'll be some, but there might be more in certain areas that prove to be more controversial than others. And our, and our goal is that if we can identify these areas and find specific texts that link to that, so this is uh, uh, Lloyd Morgan's 1894 Introduction to Comparative Psychology, then we can dig into those texts in more detail, and this is really the UK side of the project, and actually get into the argument structure and provide a very useful tool that will allow philosophers and historians of science to explore the Hathi Trust collection and find out uh, very specific things about the text that they're interested in. And as we heard yesterday, too, from Beth, the, the collection is very heavily oriented towards the 19th century, so we've, we've picked 19th, early 20th century because that's what's in the in the uh, um, public domain area as our initial focus. Obviously, we can't deal with all 2.6 million uh, volumes right now, so we're, we're trying to pick smaller subsets of that to run analyses on. Now, uh, of course, the problem is where do you find anything in this? And uh, <coughs> it, you can go and search in the Hathi Trust's own uh, uh, interface, and you might search for some terms that you think are related to the philosophical arguments that go on in the field of comparative psychology, you know, how similar are animals to humans, so words like anthropomorphism and parsimony come up there, but you'll see immediately from these results that there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's got nothing to do with comparative psychology coming up. Uh, and of course, information retrieval is a long-standing problem in, in this area. Um, we're hoping to add a new twist to it. And, and to emphasize again, our goal is in the end not the information retrieval per se, but then what we can do to analyze the data that we, that we get in this way. Um, we do have some other sources. So I mentioned the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and our own um, uh, Amphil papers. So if you search for these two terms in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, they're using Google Custom Search on their site, you find just two uh, returns, animal minds and moral development, which puts us in a rather different space than what we got from, uh, from Half the Trust. Um, if we search in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, we find animal cognition and animal consciousness come up top, and then we get down into some other things. Uh, William of Ockham at the bottom, very obvious for parsimony. And if we look at the uh, Phil papers, again, we find um, a paper about comparative psychology at the top, one about anthropomorphism in science more generally in the second, and actually a piece by me um, on an an anthropomorphism third there, which is also in the uh, animal cognition domain. So you can see philosophers are talking about these issues in a rather different space than that collection would suggest. And our, our question is, how can we match up those spaces? So we've been developing tools here. Um, I, I have this fairly long running now uh, info project, which stands for Indiana Philosophy Ontology. Um, for those of you who are computer scientists in the room or, or know something about ontologies, we have a, a rather uh, loose notion of ontology, which will uh, get us in trouble in certain places, but I'm, I'm perfectly happy to defend it. Um, we think ontologies are for people too, not just for machines. Um, but uh, as an extension for that, we've been moving into what we're now calling the Info Semantics Project, where we're making much more general use of models, not just sort of structured representations. Um, and we've, we've developed a sort of test interface, which isn't, if all of you hit it right now, would bring our server to its knees. That's one of our problems right now. But we, we can actually go in and select various corpuses. We can select various models. We can select various terms. 
And from that, we can generate lists of terms that are judged most similar to the head terms that we chose for uh, that particular model. So here we're looking at the output for two encyclopedias, the Stanford Encyclopedia with the red header on the left and the Internet Encyclopedia with the blue header on the right. One model that I chose in this case, again, Beagle, I'm just picking for the sake of illustration, it's not the only one we're interested in. And then these terms parsimony and anthropomorphism. And we can see uh, what the list of terms are. And, and if this were a live demo, and I saw enough yesterday to know not to do live demos in this room, uh, <laughs> if you roll over the terms here, then it highlights the corresponding terms in the other list. So very quickly, you can get a, a feel for how much of this data is, uh, uh, how, is similar across the different models. Um, <clears throat> we also have our original uh, Indiana Philosophy Ontology project. Um, and there, we've done uh, some human-assisted data mining to build a structured representation to get related terms to animal cognition. And that's information which can also be useful. I'm not going to have time to say very much about it. But it helps us understand the space in which philosophers, at least, are arguing about these issues. Um, and just, uh, we have an API, so if you click on the API, this interface should be robust, so anybody can go to info.cogs.indiana.edu, and there's a machine-readable version of all of these data just available on our API. Um, and we're also exposing some of the statistical analysis that we've done of the Stanford Encyclopedia through that particular API. Our goal is to actually extend this to allow you to download uh, uh, similar data for all of the different sources that we're modeling. Now, if we go back and look uh, again, here I'm, I've run the one model again. I'm just going to stick with that today. And four different head terms across the two encyclopedias. So I have Aristotle, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Again, I might have a question. This is sort of neat. I can roll around and see which terms appear wherever. Uh, I happen to highlight criticism here as the next to last on epistemology. Uh, it's, that's the only list of the top, uh, uh, I think I did, uh, let's see, 12 there, where that shows up. I guess epistemology contains a lot of criticism. Um, but using the Beagle model and going deeper into this, we might be able to find structures. So this is just using uh, Cathy Bernard's Network Workbench project, a way of looking at those terms and their associations in the two encyclopedias to try to see how much overlap there might be between the two encyclopedias. So we have Aristotle, metaphysics, ethics, and epistemology as the four head terms. The red lines are ones where that appeared only in a Stanford encyclopedia list. The blue lines are where it appeared only in an internet encyclopedia list. The purple lines are where it appeared on both of the lists. And the width of the line indicates the 0.7 or greater cosine similarity value. So you can see there's a fair amount of clustering around metaphysics in terms of uh, overlap. Uh, a bit less around Aristotle, even less around epistemology. Um, and that, that provides some interesting insight into the possible structure. But again, I don't regard the visualization here as, as the endpoint. We want to go further with the analysis. Um, so just I'm going to give you an example here from Turing that I happened to work up earlier this, this, uh, this year for another conference. So um, <clears throat> with Turing, we might wonder how the two encyclopedias differ. And uh, we use a tool here called Word to Word, also developed at IU by Brent Kiva-Kyler, um, in which we are looking at the terms associated with Turing in the two encyclopedias and the, the degree of similarity between each of the, the secondary degree of similarity between each of those terms. And here I've laid out uh, around about 125 of the most similar terms to Turing from the two encyclopedias. I've laid it out using a multi-dimensional <coughs> scaling algorithm to show you a, a neutral semantic space between the two. And then I've colorized the strongest ones for each of the two encyclopedias by uh, red, uh, as always, for the Stanford Encyclopedia and blue for the Internet Encyclopedia. And again, you can see a, a nice, clear segregation in this display. Um, and what's interesting is you notice that the Stanford Encyclopedia is stronger around issues concerning formal computability theory, um, and the Internet Encyclopedia's stronger links are around things that have to do with Turing's discussion of whether machines are good models for human cognition and consciousness. Right? Both encyclopedias cover both topics, but they, they weight them rather differently, and we can begin to see this with this kind of analysis. And if I overlay the Phil Papers data on this, so now I'm looking at the 480,000 bibliographic records, um, I think this is interesting because you see something that looks a bit like a common structure between the two where they, where they overlapped on the previous one. There was, you know, some, the, the SCP and the IEP picked out some rather similar things. And this brings up is issues for me uh, about what scale we ought to be doing these analyses. I think the temptation when we have 
you know, uh, 250 billion words available to us is just analyze them all. Of course, we're up against practical limits for that. But, but, but context matters, and finding the right grain here for the analysis is an important part of this. And our idea is we need to run different models at different scales uh, with different subsets and compare their outputs to try to understand what the models are telling us and what the data is telling us. Uh, I'm just going to skip very quickly through this um, uh, in the interest of time, but we can look at uh, philosophers. Uh, here I took Kant again, and I just used the R statistical package to lay out similarity values for Kant between the two encyclopedias. And you can see there's a correlation there, but there's also a lot of noise in that correlation. And the question is, can we do a closer analysis of that? Um, so again, uh, what we're looking at here is position so the, the, the number one term happens to be the same on both lists because Kant is self-correlated with degree one. Um, so we're plotting position on the IEP list against position on the SEP list, and that's the scatter that you get. Um, if we limit it to the first 500 terms instead of the first 10,000 terms, you can still see there's a trend, but there's a bunch of outliers. Um, if, we, if I just go back, overall, the degree of similarity is not showing up here because of the switchover, but it's about 0.73 if you do Spearman rank correlation on this graph. Um, so pretty good agreement over that many terms. But what if we do fewer? Um, and this is going to mess up, I think. Well, let's see. This is part of the last minute change. Oh, no, there we go. Okay, so, so actually it turns out to be interesting that the, the, the rank correlation between these two lists varies as a function of how many terms you take into the analysis. Um, and I can't tell you whether this double dip phenomenon here is, a, is a, an artifact at the moment, and neither can he, but we have a high degree at least of correlation on one way of looking at it early in the list, then some divergence sort of uh, within the first 10 to 20 terms, then some convergence again in terms of how closely the two encyclopedias match each other, then some further divergence, and then a long tail of convergence as we bring more and more terms into the analysis. And so if we want to understand how these two encyclopedias differ, we can't just say, here's 10,000 terms, look at the correlation between them, right? We need some tools for understanding the structure of those correlations, the structure of that data, of those data. And that's one of the things we're very interested in doing. And furthermore, not just sticking to one head term. What about all of the other terms associated with Kant? Can we find bigger structure in, in such a matrix of correlations? All right, so uh, we've already mentioned the Digging by Debating, this joint project um, with my own group, with Caddy Berner here at IU, and with uh, uh, various UK partners, um, and all of these words that we're looking at. Um, and our, our aim is to bring then as much of these data as practical as possible into the fold, um, and that is going to raise enormous scaling challenges. Um, as I mentioned, context sensitivity is going to be important. More data is not always better, right? So we need to actually run lots of, lots of models here on lots of subsets of the data to try to figure out where we get the most uh, um, bang for our buck, so to speak. Um, um, and we need ways of, of comparing these models at multiple scales. And that turns out to be something that has the st statisticians here on campus scratching their heads as, well, as much as us. Um, and we're trying to understand how to deal with this. All right. Um, we've also realized that in order to do this well, in order to run all these experiments with different models on, on different data sets, um, we are going to need a very robust architecture, not just for running the experiments, but for storing the output of those experiments and for being able to replicate those experiments. So this is just a sketch right now um, uh, of an architecture for that in which we've modularized various aspects of the of the corpus preparation, uh, the, the model running, um, and then the analysis afterwards. Um, and we are uh, trying to build this in a way that will make it usable for other projects, scalable, possibly runnable on a virtual machine through HTRC. These are all uh, directions in which we're actively working with Beth and others here to try to do that. All right, so uh, just uh, that came out terribly because of the export, but we're also working, uh, we have a second grant um, from NEH and the uh, uh, DFG in Germany to link our data to the Linked Open Data Cloud, um, and that has all kinds of interesting problems with it. But uh, I think there are numerous research avenues. Um, uh, the model comparison I've been talking about, 
how we manage to switch contexts and how we can use our understanding of what the models are telling us to help uh, get at things that people want to get out of these data. Um, what it is to have domain expertise, so some, some people think about Kant and Hegel and other people think about Kant and Hume. Um, and how do we understand that different sources are going to emphasize different things accordingly. Um, as I've mentioned, corpus comparisons, uh, we can look at the state of the profession and we can do that historically, all right, with, with all of these Hathi Trust volumes, we can look at how certain kinds of debates changed over time. So with that, I think I've left myself about five to ten minutes for questions, so I'm happy to take them. Thank you. So uh, what we're trying to do beyond uh, with the encyclopedias is actually um, be able to get in and use the kinds of statistical analyses that we think we can provide to not just locate discussions of particular topics, so topic modeling could do you that, but actually to get in and find places where scientists and philosophers are engaged in common debates. So we want to get more into the argumentative structure of the text. We want to use, I tended to focus, and this has been my bias, on content terms in philosophy, but we've also been looking at recently uh, argumentative structure terms. So, you know, consequently, therefore, all of these words that, that, that people giving arguments use, and can we use the relations between those to help us isolate particular passages, you know, pages from books, which are then ripe for the kind of detailed argumentative analysis that philosophers and historians of science care about, right? Um, so I think this is an essential part of our project is we, we, we don't just want sort of the, the, the high level abstract gloss on term similarity at, the, at a corpus level or even a book level. We want to use that as a way to get into the real structure of the text in a way that scholars of these texts uh, want to make use of them. Good. Oh, yeah. um, how are you dealing with uh, multiple languages in the corpus analysis for body trust? Are you just uh, going to use English language terms? So the question is how we're going to deal with multiple languages. And the answer is I have uh, lots of interest in doing that. But right now um, we are uh, treating whatever corpus we have simply as uh, a single language, whether it contains multiple language terms or not, right? So. Um, so what's interesting, and I, I, I could show you this, is if you, if you go into our um, list tool that lets us see related terms and you type German words such as Entwicklung into, um, into that, then the SEP will give you a whole bunch of other German terms that are associated with, associated with that. Why? Because the German discussion of development turns out to be, you know, g organismic development turns out to be very important for philosophical analysis of that concept. So there's lots of citations and things to, to German sources that give us kind of a, a little toehold into the German language there. If, as you broaden out, right, you would, you would bring more terms, but they might still be isolated islands. And that's a really, now we've got a really interesting question is can we map perhaps the structure of what goes on in the German or French or whatever discussion of, let's say, comparative psychology to the structure of what goes on in the English language discussion of that. And there we actually, um, we, we think, but we, you know, we don't have the funds or the resources to do this at the moment, but we think there might be something rather similar possible to what we're doing more generally to compare structures within a language, to now compare structures across language. And it also hooks up to our goals with the linked open data uh, project, which is to try to map points in one database to points in another database, right? That's essentially what we're doing there. So you could think about doing that between uh, models of different portions of the text and so on. But no, these are really important questions and I would love to get further with it and I'm happy to talk about, talk to people who have ideas about how to pursue that. So. All right, good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.